Amen. Don't forget to close the doors. Well, I just want to say happy birthday to you because I missed your birthday. Amen. Right? Yeah, wasn't it your birthday? Two weeks ago, right? Two weeks ago. And uh, you had a surprise party. And we, I knew about it, but I couldn't come. I had two pastors here that I had to entertain after church. But we, uh, we thought about you, and we want you to know that we, uh, we didn't miss you uh, as far as your birthday was concerned. We, we love you. So um, one of these Sundays after church, don't make any plans. We're going to take you out to dinner. Amen. Your birthday. Your choice. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to have the Condi family with us. God bless you. Good to see you. Love you guys. Um, I was asking the Lord, you know, what would you want me to share? Because that's what I always do. I ask God. It's not what I want to preach or what, I, you know, what sermon I can come up with. But I just say, God, what do you want? What's, 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 what's on your mind? What do you have for us? And um, I... I believe that the Lord wants me to share this with you this morning. It's a callous heart. You know, how many know what a callous is? You know what a callous is? A callous is a thickened area of skin that develops usually from friction or irritation over time. And sometimes what happens to our hearts is we get a callous on it. We get a, a, a real thickness on it. And because of the irritations and because of the... Um, friction that we have in life, it develops our heart to be hard. So I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, you got to show me this because I think I preached a little bit something about a heart a couple of years ago about um, how that scientists are saying that your heart has the ability to store memory. And um, <clears throat> some people believe that your heart is just a pump. It just pumps blood through and and some doctors believe that, and they say, well, if you put an artificial heart in, then you still can love, you still can do those things. But how many know that God knows what he's doing? Amen. You know, many, many physicians say you don't need your appendix and all this other stuff. It's not, it's not a vital part of your body, but I believe it is. If God put it there, it's for a purpose. We may not understand the fullness of the revelation of that purpose, but God does, and he knows what he's doing. God doesn't make spare parts for nothing. Amen? Amen? And so, having a hard heart often leads one to, to be less sensitive to the touch. You know, some people are not moved by anything. You know, they just, they don't, just don't care. And if that's where you're at, that's where you get a callous heart from. It's from the hardness and the thickness of life that you deal with every single day. Understand, you're with people that are not saved. Every single day, you're only here in church Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we probably call you or talk to you or text you or whatever. But apart from that, you're in the world quite a bit. And you see the attitudes and you see the, uh, especially on Facebook, you see the attitudes and you see the, the positions of people and where they're standing and you see so much that's going on and after a while, it can harden your heart. You can become hard. And so, if I was to ask you, what's the most important thing? What would you say? What's the most important thing for you in your life? Well, it's Jesus, but on the subject matter of what we're talking about this morning. Turn with me to Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. I'm going to read it from the NLT version. It says, God, your heart. Above all else. Why? Why should we guard our hearts? Why is he telling us to guard our hearts above everything else? Because it, is, it determines the course of your life. 
Amen. What you are today is a product of the outpouring of your heart, of your life. Now, what does the scripture mean? If our heart is just a pump, just a mechanical operation in us that just gets the blood circulating through us, then why does God use the word heart? Some, some say that, well, it's interjected with the mind. I don't believe that. And I'll tell you why I don't believe that. Because scientists are, are coming out with new revelation about the heart. And I'm going to share that with you. I want to read something that I've been researching. It's called The Brain Within Your Heart. The Brain Within Your Heart. A professor of Oxford University, David Peterson, he's got a PhD. He has straddled the two areas of the brain and the heart, and his work shows that the brain is not the sole source of your emotions, but indeed, your heart and brain work together in producing emotions. Now, this is a scientific fact. Okay, can't, can't deny that. Your heart actually contains neutrons. Very interesting. I mean, this stuff interests me. I don't know about you. But similar to those in your brain. And your heart and brain are closely connected, creating a symbiotic emotional whole. It is amazing because your heart also contains thousands of specialized neutrons predominantly located around the right ventricle surface forming the complex network. Why did God put it there? Now, neutrons are what allow your brain to form thoughts. This is factual information I'm giving you. Neutrons help to produce thoughts in your brain. Now, if I was to ask you, how many neutrons do you think your brain has? And I know some of you would probably say, well, I know some people that don't have that many. <laughs> okay. But how many neutrons do you think the average brain has? How about 100 billion? 100 billion neutrons. Why? Because... Your brain is what really controls a lot of the fac faculties that you have. It controls so many things at the same time. I'm talking, I'm moving, my fingers are moving. It's, it's producing all of this information. It's greater than any computer. The intricacies of the brain. However, your heart has 40,000 neutrons average. The same neutrons that can produce thoughts. Hello? It's amazing. What are they doing around the ventricle of your heart? On the right. What are they doing there? Are they just there? See, as science goes on, it proves the Bible to be true. The Bible said the world was round long before Columbus discovered it. Hello? The Bible says that the, the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. Science had to catch up with it later. God already knows the beginning and the end. Why does he know the beginning and the end? Because he created it all. Hallelujah. The neutrons are what allow your brain to form thoughts. So you have 40,000 neutrons average in your heart, in the muscle of the heart. I shared this uh, quite a few years ago. Some of you maybe were here, some of you weren't here, but I'm going to just repeat it so that those that didn't hear it will hear it. There was a study at Berkeley University in California, and they did a study on the heart. It was a 20-year study, I believe, 20 30 years, whatever it was. And what they did was they started to monitor heart transplant recipients. And this um, elderly gentleman, he was 
maybe like in his early 70s, he needed a heart transplant, and he was on the list. And he came up on the list, and finally uh, they found the donor. It was a 10-year-old girl that had, that had died. And so they transplanted the heart, and um, after a certain amount of time, they, uh, they were monitoring this guy that had the heart transplant, and he started to like things that he never liked before. There was a certain kind of music that he never listened to before, and he found himself drawn to listen to different kinds of music. There was kinds of foods that he didn't eat before that all of a sudden now he was desiring these foods. But not only that, when they started to do a psychological analysis of this man, they found out that he was having nightmares. So they brought in a, a psychologist to come in to kind of monitor, to find out what the nightmares, if it meant anything. And what the nightmares was is he, would, he saw this little girl being stabbed to death. Described the house, the paintings on the house, on the walls, the, the color of the walls, the, the room. He described everything. And, he, and, he, and they said, well, let's do some research. So they found out, and they started to research that out, and they found out that the little girl's heart that was donated was the girl was murdered. So when they found that out, they called in the authorities, and they said, hey, we think we have something here. And so they begin to work together and put the scenario together, and they found out that the very picture that this man was seeing in these nightmares represented one of the neighbor's house where the girl lived. So what they did was they got a, they got a warrant to go in, and they, they went to this neighbor's house, and it was exactly the same picture, the same color, everything. And when they went in, the, the, the man finally confessed that it was him that killed the little girl. And that's how they caught him. Now, how could this man who never knew the family, never knew anything, know that if the heart is just a pump? Because there's neutrons in the heart that make the heart think. It wasn't the little girl that was communicating with him. It was her heart. Because it was thoughts in her heart. Look at Matthew for a moment. 15, verse 18 to 19. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. Verse 19. For from the heart, look at this. I never understood the scripture until I understood this. From the heart come evil thoughts. Your heart has the ability to produce evil thoughts because of the neutrons that are in your heart and the right ventricle. Do you find that amazing? I find that amazing. For the evil thoughts, sometimes we think it comes from our minds. Yes, that's when the enemy puts it in our thoughts. The enemy can speak to our minds. He says, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, thief, theft, lying, slander. All come from evil thoughts that are in the heart. We sing that song, change my heart, oh God. God's not going to give you a heart transplant, literally. But he can change the thinking patterns of the neutrons. Hallelujah. He can change your heart. That's why he can, he can change anybody. Doesn't matter how vile or how evil they are, God can change anybody. But you ever wonder sometimes why you don't change? It's because you're dealing with the thoughts and not your heart. 
There was a gospel track many years ago that said 18, missing heaven by 18 inches. And that's exactly the, the measurement from your head to your heart. 18 inches. If just knowing God in your mind, then the whole world would be saved because people believe. You ask unbelievers if they believe in Jesus, they say yes. I believe Jesus. They're religious, they go to church. What has to happen to them? There has to be a conversion. A conversion of what? Of your heart. You ever wonder why some people just don't get it in their brains? Because they're not thinking with their heart. They're thinking with their brain. And so everything that goes and forms in Scripture just forms in their brain as information. It doesn't go into the heart, which is where experience comes from. I find that very interesting. That those neutrons in your heart, God put there so that you could feel emotion from your heart, not just your head, but from your mind, not from your mind, but just from your heart. It's amazing how today's worship went. Proverbs uh, 27, 19. If you could put that in the NIV for me, I appreciate it. 27, 19. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. What you are reflecting in your life right now is a product of your heart. Your choices, where you go, what you say, what you do, all reflects where your heart is. That's why God's word says, where your treasure lies, there will your, your heart lie also. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Where your treasure lies, where, wherever it lies, that's where your heart's going to be. Whatever you, you treasure the most in life. And if you look at your life, you'll see where your heart is. It's amazing. As the water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. What you do and the choices that you make reflect your heart, your life. Proverbs 3.5 says this. Trust in the Lord with all of your mind. Is that what it says? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're awake. He said, trust in the Lord with all of your, and lean not on your own. So there's two things he's talking about. He's talking about your heart, and he's talking about your mind, because that's where you understand. Hello? Two things is different. It's different. It's not the same. Science is proving that. Know also that the heart is, is also working with the brain. They work together. But the heart can also work separate. Because your mind can say one thing and to go do one thing, and your heart convicts you and says, no, don't do that. There's another thought. Or you want to go do that particular sin, and you feel like you're going to sin in this area, and, the, and, and you go to do it, but something in your Heart tells you, no. How can I prove that? Thy word have I hid in my, that I might not. A lot of times we try to overcome things with thinking and positive thoughts. It's not about positive thinking and positive thoughts. It's about allowing God into the areas in the innermost parts of your heart. 
where those neutrons are and say, God, take, make my heart new. Hallelujah. A clean mind won't occur. How many have a problem with thoughts sometimes? You won't clean up your mind unless you clean up your heart. Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart. What does that mean? To take your heart out and wash it? No. It means the neutrons that are in there, the thought patterns that are in there, needs to be changed to what God has for you. Sometimes we can't seem to forget or be healed, and that is because we are trying to think it away rather than allowing God to heal our hearts. You can't think it away. Psalm 147, verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart. Do you ever have a broken heart? Well, your heart's not broken. The valve's not broken. The, it's still pumping. Is it a figure of speech or is it real that you can experience a broken heart? The thought patterns and the thinking is, is, is messed up now because somebody did something to you. He heals the broken heart and he binds up their wounds. He binds them up so that they can't reflect in your life. Now, I'm not talking about your head, I'm talking about your heart. Because when people do things to you and say things about you and say all kinds of terrible things, what's the one thing that people tell you? Don't take it to heart. Let it flow off of you like water on a duck's back. Just let it flow off of you. Don't take it to heart because those thoughts of your heart will begin to rule you. The wounds. What do we need God to do? What has God done for us? But we don't realize it sometimes. Look at Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Matthew 22, verse 7. Uh, 37, I'm sorry. 22, 22, Matthew 22, verse 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy... with all thy... and with all thy... So if the heart is the mind, how come he says mind twice? Hello? What's the first one he says? Your heart, because out of the heart are the issues of life. You've got to love him with all of your heart, not just your mind, not just your soul, your intellect, and all that other stuff. Not just those things, the soulical realm, but the spiritual realm, your heart. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart. It's different. I'm trying to find that other scripture that just came to my mind. God's word says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. (coughs) 
Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, a new heart will I give you. Not talking about physical, but spiritual. But a new heart. He's not going to give you a heart transplant in the literal, but he's going to do something in your heart. What is that? He's going to change the neutron pattern of thinking. That's why the Bible says, have the same mind that was in Christ that was in you. Let it be in you. The same mind that Christ has, you have it in you. Because the thought patterns work together with the thought patterns in your heart. And you can store that in your heart. He said, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit, and, and I will put within you, and I will take away the what? What's a stony heart? It's hard. It's callous. It's a heart because of time and because of people and because of situations that have happened in your life that you develop a hard heart and you say to yourself, I will, I will forgive, but I won't forget. And can I tell you, you haven't truly forgiven from your heart. You've forgiven from your head, but it's still stored in your heart. Let me ask you this. When God forgives you, does he forgive you totally? He says he throws your sin in the sea of his forgetfulness. So if somebody really has forgiveness, they will forget. If you will allow God to change you. How many times you've done things in your life uh, as a, as a non-Christian, and now you've been with the Lord for a few years, and then you, something happens and it triggers, and you go, wow, I used to do that. You didn't even remember doing those things, but then you go, wow, I remember doing that. Why? Because that person, that old man is dead, no longer is in existence. God is beginning to do a new work, a new, he's, that new spirit that he puts within you, that new heart he's trying to transform in you. He can't transform just your mind. He's going to transform your heart. That's why people can't let go of things. They hold on to things, hurts and disappointments, and all kinds of things. They hold on to that because they, they, yet they, in their minds they say, okay, I forgive, but their hearts, they don't forgive because the neutrons are still in control and saying, I won't forget. But you've got to change that thought pattern. You've got to allow God to change that in you. He said, I'll take away the stony heart. The stony heart is an unforgiving heart. The stony heart is a, is a heart of selfishness. The, the stony heart is one that only cares about self and doesn't care about anyone else. He wants to remove that stony heart from you and from me. He so said, I'll give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, a heart that's pliable, a heart that you can allow my word to come in and work in your life and, and work. It's not just about intellect. It's not about just getting it up here. That's why I tell you, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. What you truly care about in life will be reflective of what your heart is by your life. If you love God... If you say you love God, then love him with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. If you really love God, then God's going to be first in your life. As Alicia was saying during worship, she says, you know, when we come to church, it's not just to come to church because we gather together in, in accordance to God's word because he wants us to get together. He wants us to pray together. He wants us to have Bible study. He wants us to do these things. And so what happens is, is that it's a reflection of your life. That's why when I see people slack from that, and over years of experience, they start to backslide. The heart gets cold, colder and colder. It gets easier and easier and easier and easier and easier to stay away. 
I've seen it a thousand times, if not more, of people that have done that in churches. And I've observed that, and I've observed it, and I've observed it. And, and every one of them says, oh, not me. That won't happen to me. Okay, Peter. Peter. Oh, if everyone forsakes you, Lord, I won't forsake you. He said, Between the, before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. No, I'm too spiritual. I'm Peter. Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And I'm, you know, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. No. <laughs> Hebrews 3.12. Hebrews 3.12. Come on. Hebrews 3.12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, our sisters, a what? An evil heart of what? Unbelief. I don't believe that. I don't believe what Pastor's saying. Unbelief comes from an evil heart. Why do you think Jesus couldn't do many mighty miracles? It was because of their unbelief. They just wouldn't believe God. How can you truly believe God in anything unless your heart is renewed? Unless God replaces that stony heart with a heart of flesh, you will not be able to discern between what is God and what is not. Thank you. Lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief in what? Departing from the living God. Living God. Somebody said it this morning up here, he's not a God of the dead people, he's, he's alive, he's real. He's a God of the living, he's not the God of, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're alive, they're not dead. Their physical bodies are in the grave, but they're still alive. We don't believe in soul sleep. He's alive. God is the God of the living. An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. How do we depart from the living God? Can I, can I say this? Is anyone here an island by themselves? Are you self-sustaining? Okay, what part of the body are you? What part of the body are you? What part of the body are you? Am I talking funny? You got a funny look on. She's like. Not your physical body. You're thinking up here. What part of the body are you? Are you the hand, the foot, the knee, the elbow? In the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We all make up the body of Christ, but we all have different parts. Just think if, if your car just had an alternator. That's it. It was a big alternator under the hood. You wouldn't go anywhere. You've got to have all the parts working, functioning, and intertwining together. In the same way, as the body of Christ, we all have a place. Now, what would happen today if Diane, your left hand and arm, just decided they wanted to stay home? And so your, your arm just detached and stayed home. How would you drive? Right? Or if your gas pedal foot decided it wanted to stay home, how would you accelerate? You follow what I'm trying to say to you? What I'm trying to say to you is, is that collectively we make up the body of Christ and we need each other. We need to fellowship with each other because we are showing forth 
a unity that the Bible talks about. Matthew 18.35. Is this helping anybody? You want to keep a pliable heart. You want to keep a soft heart before the Lord. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your Hearts. Forgive not everyone his brother that trespasses. A lot of times we acknowledge forgiveness in our brain. Okay, I forgive you, but we don't have anything to do with that person anymore. Unless that person is toxic to us, then we don't need, we don't need to be around them. <coughs> There's some people that will ask you for forgiveness and they'll keep on hammering at you and, and, and not respecting you and all this other stuff. You don't have to be around those people. You can forgive them in your heart and in your mind, but you don't have to be with them. But you have to forgive from your heart that your brother that trespasses against you. You have to forgive. Not just from here, but from here. And some, I was talking, I was counseling with somebody one time, and they said, well, how do you know when you truly forgive? I said, you know when you truly forgive... When uh, all of a sudden you see that person and there's not a in you. You know that when you don't have that feeling, but there's nothing there, that's when you truly have forgiven and forgetting. Sometimes somebody will come to me and they'll say something to me. I haven't seen them in years. They'll say, oh, you know, I, I did this, and I'm, I'm sorry. And I said, well, I don't remember that. But thank you anyway. It's okay. <coughs> you will be the most free person if you will forgive from your heart. Now, I'm sure that there's things that people have done against you, whether it's your, your brother or sister in the Lord, or, or it's a pastor, or it's a church, or it's a husband, or a wife, or a mother, or a father, the deep hurts that they've done to you, if you don't get them out of your heart, they will, they will actually cause you to be frozen. If you don't deal with it, you won't go forward. Ever wonder why you can't go forward? That these things still give you an... <laughs> because you haven't dealt with it in your heart. You need to deal with it in your heart. Once you let it go, guess what? You're free. Amen? Because he gave you a new heart. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you're converted, he's given you a new heart, a new heart that's able to deal with and forgive and to restore and to forget. Why do we need God's word? We need God's word because it does something to us. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God can you put it in the NLT for me? For the word of God is alive. Is this alive to you? Is it? Or is it dead? It's just a dead letter, you know. The letter without the spirit is death. But the letter with the spirit brings life. Because it's the spirit of God that breathes on his word. And it brings life to you. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, 
cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It's, it's touched every part of life here. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now look, play that and uh, put that on the King James for me. For the word of God is quick, it's powerful, sharpening into his sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. Thoughts and intents. That means your heart has to make decisions. Hello? Of the heart. You want to know when you begin to worship God? Let me, let me, let me go back a little bit. Remember when those, those, I think it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of that, Jesus said to him, well has Isaiah prophesied of you. For you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Worship me with your lips. Okay, well, yeah, my lips, but what are my lips doing? They're moving, they're bringing forth thought. Where's my thought coming from my head? There are people that worship God from their head but not from their heart because their hearts are far from him. But when you enter into worship, you're worshiping with all of your heart, everything that's within you because you don't care who's wearing what, who's doing what. Now, I know it's very hard for worship leaders that are up here because sometimes when they're worshiping, they can see people's faces. In fact, you know, it was kind of disturbing for me this morning because uh, we came in and, and um, somebody was cleaning. And they found fingernails all on the floor of one of those rolls. Somebody's cutting their fingernails and tossing their fingernails on the floor. I'm like, what's up with that? Sometimes you watch people worshiping. They're, they're looking at their nails. They're banging on their nails. They're picking their nails looking at their phone. You're not worshiping. Because your heart's far from him. When you worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. What's the truth? What's the truth? You know, I often read that scripture. We worship him in spirit, I can understand that, and truth. What truth? That he deserves it because of who he is. He deserves it because of who he is. And I can only do that truthfully, and I can only do that wholeheartedly when I do it from my heart. It's not like this. I surrender all. Oh, did you get those new shoes last week? I surrender all. Did you get that dress there? Did you buy that? All to Jesus. How much did you pay? <laughs> we do that. All to thee, my hate. You know the Red Sox one? I surrender. Why does that happen? Because we have a divided heart. But when you come into worship, when you come in and you worship with everything that's within you, everything that's within your heart, can I tell you, that's where God moves. He doesn't just move when you're thinking. He moves when you really mean it from your heart. He'll touch you. He'll touch your, your life and you'll be worshiping him, and all of a sudden, you can't help it. You're drawn to this altar, and you come down this altar, and you're weeping, and you're crying, because God is touching your heart, not your head. And he wants that. He wants to touch your heart. 
He knows what the intents of your heart is. You come in here with all kinds of problems, all kinds of situations. Some of you probably had a fight with your spouse before you got here. Maybe an argument, maybe a disagreement, whatever it was. You know what you've got to learn to do? Is to lay that aside. Lay it aside. Don't let that get into your heart. Don't let bitterness, unforgiveness, resentfulness, any of that stuff, don't let it get in your heart. It will corrupt you. You want all the pots flowing together. When you come in in here, when you come into this place, you know, we've experienced the presence of God this morning, but there's so much more. There's so much more, and it's all to do with the preparation that you have before you get here. It's not driving here and telling the kids, if you don't shut up, I'm going to smack you. Stop hanging out the window. Get your legs back in the car. You want something to cry about? I'll give you something. And then come into church, I surrender. <laughs> come on. But can I tell you, even if those things do happen, don't let it get in your heart. Let it set in the recesses of your mind, and when you walk through that door, say, God, I'm here for you, for nothing else, no one else. I'm here to worship you with all of my heart. God, change my heart. Don't let these things get into my heart. God, don't let them bog me down so that I can't worship you today because that's why I'm here. I'm not here to see Pastor Bob. I'm not here to be in this church. I'm here to worship you because you're here. You're here. You're here. Your presence is here. And I want to worship you, God, because I love you. Now you know what part of the body you are? (laughs) He's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. What you intend. Sometimes we do things for the wrong motives. Hello. Sometimes we, God, God, if you really do this for me, oh, God, if you really do whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, God, if you really do this for me, then I'll do this. If you really do this for me, then I'll do that. Then God does this, and what do we do? We don't do that. But you made a vow to God. You made a promise to God. God, if you get me out of this, God, if you really move in my life, if you really help me now, I'm in desperate need, God, but if you really do this for me, God, then I will do what you said. Hmm. Are we? Are we? Can I tell you something about God? God don't play games. We think God's just up there like a big holly jolly, jolly goly, you know, type of person. I make up words as I go along. <laughs> you know, just sitting up there, ah, you, you know, we just mistreat God, and he just says, oh, that's all right. You know, don't worry about it. It's okay. No. God's not up there doing that. Uh-uh. If that's the kind of God you got, mm-mm. You know, let me just close with this. In the book of Exodus, Moses is on the backside of the desert. Been there 40 years. Think about that. Think you've been waiting on God long enough? 40 years. 40 years. And all of a sudden, God shows up in a burning bush. 
Now Moses sees this bush. He sees this manifestation of God's presence, because that's what it is. How many know God's not the bush? Some people think God is a bush. He's not the bush. The Bible says he was in the bush. Yet the bush was not consumed. Very important lesson there. Okay. God can fill your life. Don't be afraid that like he's going to consume you. And you're going to go crazy. That's what the devil says. Don't get too spiritual, you know. You, people think you're crazy. So God shows up in this bush, manifested in this bush. And the Bible says that when Moses saw the bush, he said this. Let me turn aside to see this bush and why it's not consumed. Moses turned to see the revelation of God's presence. What happened next? The Bible says when God saw that Moses turned aside, he spoke. Hello? God's not going to speak to you unless you turn aside. When you're in church, unless you're really worshiping in spirit and in truth, he's not going to speak. That's why I long for the day when we have prophecy and tongues and God speaks again. I, I, I want that so bad. I say, God, speak. I say it this morning as I was at the keyboard, God, speak to us. Yeah, he speaks through his word. I understand that. But he gave the gifts to be manifested. But they're only manifested as you desire them. Because God wants to use you. So he turns aside. He sees the revelation. He sees the presence of God. And because he turned aside, God speaks to him. But what is the first thing God says? Hey, Moses, buddy, how you doing? How's the family? Does he say that? Do you say, okay, Moses, what do you want? Does he say that? What does he say? First thing he tells Moses is, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. That's the standard that God shows us. If we want to see his revelation of his presence, if we want to experience the revelation of his presence, if we, we have to turn aside, we turn aside when we walk through that door and we turn aside from all of our problems, all of our situations, all of our circumstances, all of the hurt, all of the pain of all the weak of those people that have used us and abused us and spoken things against us and all of those things, we turn that aside so we can come in here and experience the revelation of his presence. And he says to you, take off your shoes spiritually. Don't take them off naturally. Because you're standing on holy ground. You're standing on a place where my presence is holy. You're staying in a place. Oh, it's not just about the goose bumps and the ducky bites and feeling good. And if you come with your whole heart, don't let your heart get calloused. Don't let that hardness, that thick skin, come upon your heart. Don't let it happen. Don't let that callous, hard flesh begin to take over your heart where God can't speak to you anymore. knocking at your heart. Hallelujah. Not your head. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. But because of the things we've gone through, our hearts have become so hard. But God says, give me your heart. When we say give, give, we give you our heart, Lord, we're saying we're giving you all of the thoughts 
all of those neutrons that are there, Lord, change those neutrons, change the thinking as I put God's word in my mind. I'm going to let it sink down into my heart so that I might not sin against you. God, change me. Change my heart, oh God. Change my heart. Because you're the potter and I'm the clay. Change me. Mold me. Shape me. Shape my heart, Lord. Neurons are what allow your brain to form thoughts. And there's one thing is for sure. This professor said, the brain in your heart communicates back and forth with the brain in your head. It's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. Let me share one more scripture with you. I don't know if I shared it already, but let me see. Twenty-two. Let's see. Where is that? It's Jeremiah seven. Jeremiah, I'm going to close for the second time. Jeremiah seventeen nine and ten says, "The heart is deceitful above all things." Are you hearing me? And desperately, desperately. Wicked. Who can know it? Then in verse 10, God speaking, he says, I, the Lord, searches the heart. I try the reins to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Because the fruit of your doings and the way of man comes from the heart. Do you want to serve God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind? Have you been hurt, disappointed, mocked, ridiculed, laughed at, misunderstood by people? Is there still an <clears throat> in you? Then let's release it today. Maybe Pastor Tom, you can play something. We need new. We need to let God work in our hearts. I love that. Neutrons are what makes your heart think. Lord, change my neutrons of my heart. Change it, Lord, so that I can become more like you. Change my heart, God. Let me ask you this morning, is there an area of your heart you need God to touch this morning. If so, just stand. I'm not going to call you up to the altar, but just stand. You know what that is. It's been a it's been a albatross around your neck for years. For years and years and years. It's 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 caused you it's stunted your growth. It's I want you just to lift, a, lift up one hand to God. Just say, God. Come on, say it with me, God. Renew the neutrons in my heart so that I think differently from my heart. Lord, I release all the hurt, all the pain, all the sorrow, and all those spoken words that have broken my heart. 
I receive right now your healing touch because you've given me a new heart. And I ask you, Lord, to let it be a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. Take away the heart of stone as I come to you now. I forgive and I release all those who have truly hurt me. And God, I take no revenge by holding these thoughts captive in my heart. I release them right now in the name of Jesus. I just want you to begin to praise him right now. Just begin to pray. Just open your mouth and say, thank you, Lord. I praise you, God. Oh, do you sense his presence in this place? Oh, he's coming down in this place. <laughs> God. Hallelujah. Just thank him. Just thank him. For his love. For his mercy. For his grace. Just thank you, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Bring healing, God. Bring healing this morning, God. That will result in a change of heart, a change of mind, God change of direction, that our, our hearts will reflect, truly our life will reflect what our heart says. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your healing, Lord, of my heart. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, a new work, Now, Lord, I can love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. And I pray for those, God, who are sitting stubbornly. I pray for them, Lord. They're not moved. Not moved by your heart. They refuse. Those who are watching by Facebook, I pray for those who have hard hearts that won't move. Have mercy, Lord. Oh, God. Protect them, Lord. Even if they don't deserve it, God, give them mercy as we learned last week about mercy. Father, I pray this morning, God, as we go our separate ways, that your love and that your presence would overwhelm our hearts, that you overwhelm us, Lord, so that we can truly come and worship you and praise you, and not just with our heads, ask this Father in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this morning.